Mr. Gajeev's book, is really about a whole series of members of a very special intimate brotherhood, Searchers of Truth, how they became aware that there was a truth that needs to be searched for again and again and again, how they came together and how one by one each stopped inevitably and gave up at a certain point, except for one person. I think that of all the masters I've uh, read about, I really think that Gurdjieff stands out uh, as the most interesting to me. And uh, as you know, he didn't want to be called a master. And that's why he led for 21 years what was called a blameworthy life instead of a praiseworthy life. He didn't want people to uh, uh, venerate him. But the real story is how a unique, extraordinary young child receives impressions that awake in him the need to become a searcher. How this turns into a search which he cannot do alone and when he sees that the remarkable men are necessary stages for him leading to the essential search which was for this unique hidden monastery, the Samung Brotherhood. We've covered a lot of the uh, major esoteric teachers of the 19th century, and today we're going to look at the uh, unusual relationship between Peter Ospensky and George Gurdjieff. I think it's fair to say that they both had a... Uh, enormous influence on 19th, 20th, well, 20th century spirituality and esoteric culture. Before I begin to explain to you in a general way what this system is about and to talk about our methods, I want particularly to impress on your minds that the most important ideas and principles of the system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. They would give only a subjective view of things. I came to the conclusion that certain real knowledge exists, that there may be schools which know exactly what we want to know, but that for some reason, they are hidden, and this knowledge is hidden. So I began to look for these schools. I travelled in Europe, Egypt, India, Ceylon, Turkey and the Near East. But it was really later, when I had already finished these travels, that I met in Russia during the war. A group of people who were studying a certain system which came originally from Eastern schools. This system began with the study of psychology, exactly as I had realised it must begin. Perhaps you realise how difficult it is to define what is meant by psychology. There are so many meanings attached to the same words in different systems that it is difficult to have a general definition. So we begin by defining psychology as study of oneself. You have to learn certain methods and principles and, according to these principles and using these methods, you will try to see yourselves from a new point of view. The chief idea of this system was that we do not use even a small part of our powers and our forces. We have in us, so to speak, a very big and very fine organisation, only we do not know how to use it. In this group, they employed certain oriental metaphors and they told me that we have in us a large house full of beautiful furniture, with a library and many other rooms. But we live in the basement and the kitchen and cannot get out of them. If people tell us about what this house has upstairs, we do not believe them, or we laugh at them, or we call it superstition, or fairy tales, or fables. 
The study of humans is closely connected with the idea of evolution. But the evolution of human beings must be understood in a slightly different way from the ordinary. Ordinarily, the word evolution applied either to humans or to anything else presupposes a kind of mechanical evolution. Certain things, by known or unknown laws, transform into other things, and these other things transform into still others, and so on. But from the point of view of this system, there is no such evolution at all. I do not speak in general, but specifically of a human being. The evolution, if it occurs, can only be the result of knowledge and effort. If we begin to study ourselves, we first of all come up against one word which we use more than any other, and that is the word I. We say, I am doing, I am sitting, I feel, I like, I dislike, and so on. This is our chief illusion, for the principal mistake we make about ourselves is that we consider ourselves one. We always speak about ourselves as I, and we suppose that we refer to the same thing all the time when in reality we are divided into hundreds and hundreds of different I's. At one moment when I say I, one part of me is speaking, and at another moment when I say I, it is quite another I speaking. We do not know that we have not one I, but many different I's connected with our feelings and desires and have no controlling I. These I's change all the time. One suppresses another, one replaces another, and all this struggle makes up your inner life. Wilson talked about how he too, when he was a young man, and and he came across books like Uspensky's In Search of the Miraculous, which is his famous account of his years with Gurdjieff, and other books, how he too felt something like that. And then I, I, there I was reading that, and I'm saying, well, I'm, gee, I'm feeling the same thing reading, reading your book. And it led me to go seek these books out. And one of the first books I did uh, find was that, was that book by Uspensky, New Model of the Universe. And it's a remarkable just compendium of different chapters and essays about a variety of different occult and esoteric and scientific and psychological things, uh, dreams, the nature of time. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this, but this was one of Uspensky's central mysteries and consciousness. And uh, this whole notion of esotericism, this whole idea that there is another kind of knowledge that has existed throughout history, but we in the modern age have lost touch with it. And that that's just sparked this whole sense of mystery in me and pretty much sent me off on you know my own journey, my own path into winding up what I'm doing now. To begin self-study, it is necessary to study methods of self-observation, but that again must be based on a certain understanding of the divisions of our functions. Our ordinary idea of these divisions is quite wrong. We know the difference between intellectual and emotional functions. For instance, when we discuss things, think about them, compare them, invent explanations or find real explanations. This is all intellectual work whereas love, hate, fear, suspicion, and so on, are emotional. But very often, when trying to observe ourselves, we mix even intellectual and emotional functions. When we really feel, we call it thinking, and when we think, we call it feeling. There are two other functions which no system of ordinary psychology divides and understands in the right way, instinctive function and moving function. Instinctive refers to the inner work of the organism, digestion of food, beating of the heart, breathing. These are instinctive functions. To instinctive function belong also ordinary senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, the feeling of cold and warmth. It is very easy to distinguish between instinctive and moving functions. We do not have to learn anything that belongs to instinctive function. We are born with the capacity to use all the instinctive functions. Moving functions, on the other hand, all have to be learned. A child learns to walk, to write, and so on. There is a very great difference between the two functions, since there is nothing inherent in moving functions, and instinctive functions are all inherent.
So in self-observation, it is necessary first of all to divide these four functions and to classify at once everything that you observe, saying, this is intellectual function, this is emotional function, and so on. If you practice this observation for some time, you may notice some strange things. For instance, you will find that what is really difficult in observing is that you forget about it. You start to observe, and your emotions connect with some kind of thought, and you forget about self-observation. Again, after some time, if you continue this effort to observe, which is a new function not used in the same way in ordinary life, you will notice another interesting thing, that generally you do not remember yourself. If you could be aware of yourself all the time, then you would be able to observe all the time, or in any case as long as you liked. But because you cannot remember yourself, you cannot concentrate. And this is why you will have to admit that you have no will. If you could remember yourself, you would have will and could do what you liked. But you cannot remember yourself, you cannot be aware of yourself, and so you have no will. You may sometimes have will for a short time, but it turns to something else and you forget about it. This is the situation, the state of being, the state from which we have to start self-study. But very soon, if you continue, you will come to the conclusion that almost from the very beginning of self-study, you have to correct certain things in yourself which are not right, to arrange certain things which are not in their right places. The system has an explanation for this. We are made in such a way that we can live in four states of consciousness. But such as we are, we use only two. One when we are asleep and the other when we are what we call awake. That is to say, in this present state. When we can talk, listen, read and write. But these are only two out of four possible states. The third state of consciousness is very strange. If people explain to us what the third state of consciousness is, we begin to think that we have it. The third state can be called self-consciousness, and most people, if asked, say, certainly we are conscious. A sufficient time or repeated and frequent efforts of self-observation is necessary before we really recognize the fact that we are not conscious, that we are conscious only potentially. If we are asked, we say, Yes, I am, and for that moment we are, but the next moment we cease to remember and are not conscious. So in the process of self-observation, we realize that we are not in the third state of consciousness, that we live only in two. We live either in sleep or in a waking state, which, in the system, is called relative consciousness. The fourth state which is called objective consciousness, is inaccessible to us because it can only be reached through self-consciousness, that is, by becoming aware of oneself first, so that much later we may manage to reach the objective state of consciousness. So, at the same time as self-observing, we try to be aware of ourselves by holding the sensation of I am here, nothing more. And this is the fact that all Western psychology without the smallest exception, has missed. Although many people came very near to it, they did not recognise the importance of this fact and did not realise that the state of humanity as they are can be changed, that you can remember yourself if you try for a long time. It is not a question of a day or a month. It is a very long study and a study of how to remove obstacles because we do not remember ourselves we are not conscious of ourselves, owing to many wrong functions in our machine, and all these functions have to be corrected and put right. When most of these functions are put right, these periods of self-remembering will become longer and longer, and if they become sufficiently long, we shall acquire two new functions. With self-consciousness, which is the third state of consciousness, we acquire a function which is called higher emotional although it is equally intellectual, because on this level there is no difference between intellectual and emotional, such as there is on the ordinary level. And when we come to the state of objective consciousness, we acquire another function which is called higher mental. 
Phenomena of what I call supernormal psychology belong to these two functions. And this is why, when I made those experiments 25 years ago, I came to the conclusion that experimental work is impossible because it is not a question of experiment but of changing one's state of consciousness. For me personally, in the beginning, the most interesting idea was that of self-remembering. I simply could not understand how people could miss such a thing. All European philosophy and psychology just missed this point. There are traces in older teachings, but they are so well disguised and placed between less important things that you cannot see the importance of the idea. When we try to keep all these things in mind and to observe ourselves, we come to the very definite conclusion that in the state of consciousness in which we are, with all this identification, considering negative emotions and absence of self-remembering, we are really asleep. We only imagine that we are awake. So when we try to remember ourselves, it means only one thing. We try to awake. And we do awake for a second, but then we fall asleep again. This is our state of being, so actually we are asleep. We can awake only if we correct many things in the machine, and if we work very persistently on this idea of awaking, and for a long time. This group I met in Moscow used oriental metaphors and parables, and one of the things they liked to speak about was prison. That man is in prison, so what can he wish for? What can he desire? If he is a more or less sensible man, he can wish for only one thing, to escape. But even before he can formulate this desire, that he wants to escape, he must become aware that he is in prison. If he does not realize that he is in prison, he cannot wish to escape. Then, when he formulates this wish, he begins to realize the possibilities of escape, and he understands that, by himself, he cannot escape because it is necessary to dig under walls and things like that. He realizes that first of all, he must have some people who would like to escape with him, a small group of people. So he realizes that a certain number of people can perhaps escape, but all cannot escape. One cannot and all cannot, but a small number of people can. Again, in what conditions? He comes to the conclusion that it is necessary to have help. Without that, they cannot escape. They must have maps, files, tools and so on. So they must have help from outside. This is exactly, almost literally, the position of man. We can learn how to use the unused parts of our machine. This prison means really that we sit in the kitchen and basement of our house and cannot get out. One can get out, but not by oneself. Without school one cannot. School means that there are people who are already escaping, or, at any rate, are preparing to escape. School cannot begin without help from another school, without help from those who escaped before. From them, we can get certain ideas, a certain plan, a certain knowledge. These are our tools. I repeat, all cannot escape. There are many laws against it. To put it simply, it would be too noticeable and that would immediately produce a reaction from mechanical forces. Prison is just an example. For us, prison is our sleep, and without metaphors, we want to awake when we realize that we are asleep. It must be realized emotionally. We must understand that we are helpless in sleep. Anything may happen. We can see pictures of life, see why things happen in one way or another, both big and small things and realize that it is because people are asleep. Naturally, they cannot do anything in sleep. You know, in relation to these ideas and these methods, we live in a rather strange time in one sense, because schools are disappearing quickly. Thirty or forty years ago, you could find many kinds of schools which practically do not exist now or are much more difficult to find. We begin with psychology. Study of oneself, of the human machine, of states of consciousness, methods of correcting things and so on. But at the same time, 
an important part of the system is given to doctrines of general laws of the world, because we cannot understand even ourselves if we do not know some of the fundamental laws which lie behind all things. Ordinary scientific knowledge is not sufficient for this, because, just as such important points as absence of self-remembering were missed in psychology, so our science either forgot or never knew the fundamental laws on which everything is based. As I said, all things in the world, whether big or small, on every scale, are based on two fundamental laws, which in this system are called the Law of Three and the Law of Seven. The Law of Three, in a short description, means that three forces enter into every manifestation, into every phenomenon and every event. They are called, but these are only words because they do not express their qualities, positive, negative and neutralizing, or active, passive and neutralizing, or still more simply, they may be called first force, second force, and third force. These three forces enter into everything. In many cases, we understand the need of two forces, that one force cannot create an action, that there is action and resistance. But generally, we are not aware of the third force. This is connected with the state of our being, the state of our consciousness. In another state, we would be aware of it in many cases where we do not see it now. Sometimes we can find examples of third force in ordinary scientific study. For example, in chemistry and in biology, we can find the necessity of a third force in the creation of events and phenomena. We begin with the study of psychology. Later we shall talk more about three forces, and we may find some examples of their interaction. But it is better to be prepared and get accustomed now to the idea of the need to study these three forces. The law of seven must also be described briefly. It means that no process in the world goes without interruptions. To illustrate this idea, let us take a certain period of activity in which vibrations are increasing. Suppose they begin at 1,000 vibrations a second and increase to 2,000 vibrations a second. This period is called an octave because this law was applied to music and the period was divided into seven notes and a repetition of the first note. The octave, particularly the major octave, is really a picture or formula of a cosmic law because in cosmic arrangements, within one octave, there are two moments when vibrations slow down by themselves. Vibrations do not develop regularly. In the major octave, this is shown by the missing semitones. That is why we are told that it is a picture of a cosmic law. But this law has nothing to do with music. The reason why it is necessary to understand the law of seven is that it plays a very important part in all events. If there were no law of seven, everything in the world would go to its final conclusion. But because of this law, everything deviates. For instance, if rain began, it would go on without stopping. If floods began, they would cover everything. If an earthquake began, it would go on indefinitely. But they stop. Because of the law of seven, because at every missing semitone things deviate, they do not go by straight lines. The law of seven also explains why there are no straight lines in nature. Everything in our life and our machine is also based on this law. So we shall study it in the work of our organism, because we have to study ourselves not only psychologically, not only in connection with our mental life, but also in connection with our physical life. In our physical processes, we find many examples of the working of this law. At the same time, the Law of Seven explains that, if you know how and at what moment to do it, you can give an additional shock to an octave and keep the line straight. We can observe in human activity how people start to do one thing and after some time do quite a different thing, still calling it by the first name without noticing that things have completely changed. But in personal work, particularly in work connected with this system, we must learn how to keep these octaves from deviating, how to keep a straight line. Otherwise, we shall not find anything. We have to keep returning to psychology even when studying other sides of the system, 
because only with the help of the psychological study shall we really increase our knowledge. Without it, we shall only be learning words. Only when we know how to study ourselves psychologically in relation to the working of our minds, our cognition and so on, can we begin to understand something. I will try to give some examples of how self-study should begin. We spoke already of lying, and I gave a possible definition of psychology as the study of lying. So one of the first and most important things for you to observe is lying. Very much akin to lying are our illusions, things about which we deceive ourselves, wrong ideas, wrong convictions, wrong views, and so on. All these must be studied, because until we begin to understand our illusions, we can never see truth. In everything, we must first separate our illusions from facts. Only then will it be possible to see whether we can really learn something new. One of the most important and most difficult illusions to conquer is your conviction that you can do. Try to understand what that means. You think that you make a plan, decide, start, and achieve what you want. But the system explains that humans 1, 2, and 3 cannot do. Cannot do anything, everything just happens to you. That may sound strange, particularly now when everybody thinks they can do something. But little by little, you will understand that many things we are accustomed to say about humans generally could only be true about beings of a higher level and do not apply to you. It is very important to understand that you cannot do, because this is the basis of our view of ourselves, and even when we become disappointed with ourselves, we think that other people can do. We cannot accept completely and fully that things happen mechanically and that nobody gives a push to them. At first, it is difficult to see this on a big scale, but you will see it very soon in yourself. In studying yourself, if you try to do certain things which generally you do not do, for instance, if you try to remember yourself, if you try to be aware of yourself, then very soon you will see whether you can do something or not. And in most cases, you will find that you cannot do it. Another very important problem we must consider is the idea of good and evil in this system, because generally people's views are very confused on this subject and it is necessary to establish for yourself how to understand it. From the viewpoint of the system, there are only two things that can be compared or seen in human beings, the manifestation of mechanical laws and the manifestation of consciousness. If you want to find examples of what you can call good or bad to arrive at some standard, you will see at once that what we call evil is always mechanical. It can never be conscious. And what we call good is always conscious. It cannot be mechanical. It will take a long time to see the reason for that, because these ideas of mechanical and conscious are mixed in our mind. We never describe them in the right way. So this is the next point you must consider and study. Further, in connection with the question of good and evil, we must try to understand the relative positions of morality and conscience. What is morality and what is conscience? We can say, first of all, that morality is not constant. It is different in different countries, in different centuries, in different decades, in different classes, with people of different education and so on. What may be moral in the Caucasus may be immoral in Europe. For instance, in some countries, blood revenge is a most moral thing. If a man refuses to kill somebody who killed his distant uncle, he would be considered most immoral. But in Europe, nobody would think that. In fact, most people would think a man very immoral to kill anybody, even a relative of somebody who had killed his uncle. So, morality is always different and it always changes. But conscience never changes. Conscience is a kind of emotional understanding of truth in certain definite relations, generally in relation to behaviour, to people, and so on. This is always the same. It cannot change, and it cannot differ in one nation or another, in one country or another, in one person or another. 
I said that we should study the ideas of this system chiefly in connection with the evolution of humanity, and I explained that by evolution we must understand a conscious process and conscious efforts, continuous and connected. There is no mechanical evolution as it is sometimes understood. Evolution, if it is possible, can only be conscious, and the beginning of evolution is always the evolution of consciousness. It cannot be the evolution of anything else. If consciousness begins to evolve, other things begin to grow and evolve. If consciousness remains on the same level, everything else remains on the same level. There are several things which it is important to understand from the very beginning in relation to evolution. First, that out of the very large quantity of humanity at levels 1, 2 and 3, only a very few can become number 4, 5, 6 and 7, or even begin. That must be very well understood, because if we begin to think that everybody can evolve, we cease to understand the conditions necessary for the beginning of evolution as I described them for you in the example of escape from prison. Wisdom is the end of a process which has no end. It is what in much more dynamic, practical terms we can call a search. And in fact, in meetings with remarkable men, one of the things that we hear very early on is how there was a little band of young people who were touched by the need to become seekers of truth. Once again, truth like wisdom is something that you have to pay a great price. You have to struggle and toil like climbing the Himalayas, but without the hope that you once get to the peak. As we know from hills and mountains, you get to what seems to be the highest point and you look and you see, oh no, it's just concealing the fact that there's something farther. And if you do manage to get there and you look around you, you see you've got nowhere compared with what is now calling you to make the next step. I remember very good this. 83 years ago. 